Well, I am convinced at uh, this age in my life, and I just celebrated another birthday. I'll leave you the guessing of what number birthday that was. But I'm convinced at this age and this stage of my life that life is too short to eat bad food. And I'm not talking about eating spoiled food. I'm not talking about like going to the fridge and like something's a week past due and you're like, well, it's been refrigerated so it should be fine. I'm not talking about eating spoiled food. I'm not talking about eating food that's bad for you. I'll leave you to judge that. I I wouldn't take any dietary advice from me. I I eat cake for breakfast. Uh, Pop-tarts are a regular staple of my breakfast diet. Don't be taking any dietary advice from me. I'm talking about eating food that people say is really good for you, but that tastes really, really bad. Let me just, in, in in the interest of time, let me just give you one example, kale. Okay, some of you are, are with me on this by the applause. Some of you are like, how could you? Kale is so nutritious. It's a superfood. It is packed full of vitamins and nutrients. It's, it's got antioxidants that help with inflammation and, and help you with, with uh, immunity. And, and, and it's got all kinds of things. It's, it's a great source of fiber, which helps you with, just Google what good fiber helps you with. Uh, it turns out that kale is 85% water, which means eating kale actually helps you with hydration. But you know what the other 15% of kale is? 85% water and 15% bug spray. I'm telling you, kale, that stuff tastes like bug spray. It is absolutely awful. But every time I talk about how much I hate kale, there's always someone who comes around and says, oh, pastor, kale's so good for you. You should just try to like it. Just douse it in ranch and throw it on a cheeseburger. (laughs) No. Until In-N-Out starts putting kale, In-N-Out has perfected the cheeseburger. This is the part where you say amen. In-N-Out has perfected the cheeseburger. And until they start putting it on their cheeseburgers, I'm out. I'm not doing it, but there is no possible way. There are no seasonings. There's no way to, actually, uh, I I have found that if you uh, mix in a little bit of coconut oil and like stir fry your kale a little bit in the coconut oil, it actually does make it easier to scrape right into the trash. It's great. (laughs) There's no possible way that you could season kale to make it taste any better. And really, this is just kind of a roundabout way for me to introduce our scripture this morning, where Jesus is talking about flavors and seasoning. It's one of the most famous messages, one of the most famous parts of the most famous message that Jesus has ever preached in his entire ministry. And he gets to this part at the very beginning of the message and really just drops some dimes and starts spitting fire very early on when he says this, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. This shows up all over social media. It's on bumper stickers. It's on T-shirts. It's made it onto billboards. It's one of the most quotable passages in the most famous sermon ever given. And this is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored. It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people put a light or nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. As the original audience heard this, as Jesus was teaching on this hillside, they would have immediately caught some of the context and the meaning that Jesus had behind the words that he was sharing. Here you've got several hundred settlers who are sitting down on a hillside overlooking the Sea of Galilee, listening to a carpenter from Nazareth, a rabbi named Jesus, 
And over to one side of them is the city of Magdala. In Aramaic, Magdala means tower. It's the city that was the primary fishing village of the Sea of Galilee. A fisherman would head out onto the Sea of Galilee, which was really more so a lake. The fishermen would catch all of their fish, bring it back into the shore, and take it immediately to a tower in Magdala, where they would store it in a special salt tower. And this tower would be what fed the entire area and the entire community. Salt was so critical in that day. It was so critical in the ancient world because they didn't have refrigeration. The Greek referred to this city of Magdala literally as the city of salted fish. Babylonians referred to it as the tower of fish. Literally, Magdala was the salt center for the entire region of Galilee. The historian Josephus said that Magdala had a population of about 30,000 people in the time of Jesus. And it was a really large city. And Josephus said that it was rumored that this was the hometown of Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, if you remember, was the very first human witness of the resurrection of Jesus. Salt was a precious commodity in the ancient world. In fact, soldiers, Roman soldiers, used to get paid. Their currency was payment in salt. In that day, the official language of the Roman Empire was the Latin language, a dead language now, a language that I took in high school because I was going to be a dentist, and here I am as a pastor, and I finally get to use it many, many years later. The Latin word for salt is the word sal. It's where we get the English word salary. Now, you and I can buy a dump truck full of salt at Costco for a nickel, But in that day, it was so incredibly valuable. So valuable that Homer referred to salt as divine. Plato referred to salt as the substance dear to the gods. Maybe you've heard the phrase, you can take that with a grain of salt. It's actually a reference to salary. So if you take it with a single grain of salt, it's not really worth that much at all. And so... There you go, that one's free for you today. When that comes up as an answer clue on Jeopardy, you're ready to go. But if we are unpacking the meaning and the context around uh, when Jesus was teaching this, we've got to ask the question, what was salt used for in the first century? What did Jesus want us to understand and realize and recognize when he said we're supposed to live and we're supposed to be the salt of the earth? Well, salt in the ancient world had several different uses. It was used in several main ways. Number one, it was used as a preservative. And so Jesus was talking about salt in the full view of the city of salt, the city of Magdala. And he says, you are the salt of the earth. Salt was worked into the fish as a preservative to preserve its goodness, to slow down It's decay, and so when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, he's literally inviting us and saying to us that his people ought to be in every industry, in every area, in every organization, in every space, in every sphere of culture, to be ambassadors of hope. Literally, we're to slow down the societal and moral decay. You are the salt of the earth. We as followers of Jesus should be preserving what's good in our culture. We ought to be speaking out against injustice in our world. Our organizations, our companies, our businesses, our workplaces should feel different with the people of God working in them. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. But salt wasn't just a preservative. It was also, in the ancient world, a disinfectant. Uh, Salt was used as a medicinal treatment in the ancient world. If you're anything like me as a kid of the 80s or earlier, anytime you got hurt, anytime you got like a scraped knee over at a friend's house, the first thing that your friend's mom would say is, get out of the living room, quit bleeding all over my rug and get into the kitchen. And then in every kitchen in the 80s were two products that would be used as a disinfectant. Number one is mercurochrome. Anybody else got a mercurochrome witness in the house today? 
a couple of you. If you don't know what mercurochrome is, it was actually the precursor to chemotherapy. Not actually, but if you open a jar of mercurochrome in the kitchen, all of the flies within about 25 yards of you would just drop dead out of the sky. Mercurochrome will kill anything. Bactine, on the other hand, that was a little more high tech if you were growing up in the 80s. On the label, Bactine says it doesn't burn. <laughs> but some of you are laughing because you've used Bactine on an injury, on a wound, on a scrape, and it burns so bad that you've got to drop a brick on your toe just to forget about the burn from the Bactine. Y'all smell what I'm stepping in? You know what I'm talking about? In the ancient world, they didn't have Bactine. They didn't have Mercurochrome. They had salt. And salt was a disinfectant that they would put on a wound or a cut to prevent infection. Salt would literally create the conditions for a wound to heal. Let's not just keep this biblical. Let's make this personal. Let's make this practical. Today, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, a preservative, a disinfectant. And it's odd for us to think about salt as a disinfectant because we know the phrase pouring salt on the wound. If you've got a cut, it already hurts. When you add salt, it hurts worse. But the reality is science shows us that our body actually contains about four ounces of salt. Without enough salt in our body, our muscles won't contract, our blood won't circulate, our heart won't beat, food won't digest, which is the moment that if you take our life and lay over it this map of Scripture, these words of Jesus begin to shock us. These words of Jesus begin to ambush us a bit, press in on some of our comfort in this moment, because if we're supposed to be the salt of the earth, that means that Jesus has designed and called and invited us as Christians to bring health and healing. And yet, what are Christians most known for these days? I'll tell you. Barna did a research study. They wrote a book called Unchristian, all about what non-Christians, people outside the faith, think about when they think about Christians. What are Christians like? Here's how unchristians answer. Christians are hypocritical. Christians are just interested in converting people. Christians are just anti-LGBTQ. Christians are sheltered from the realities of life. They're too political. They're too judgmental. Brennan Manning said this, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians. It's not science. The greatest single cause of atheism is not that somehow science proves evolution and evolution pr disproves the Bible. No, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians. Brennan goes on to say, who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and then walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. This is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. And what Jesus is saying is that our identity on this earth is salt. You are the salt of the earth. Not you ought to be kind of salty. Not you ought to have characteristics uh, uh, of salt. Not they are the salt of the earth. No, you are the salt of the earth. Not the professionals, not the ones that have been trained, not the ones that are serving, not the ones that have got their life all together. No, you as a follower of Jesus are the salt of the earth. Which means we should be salt that helps people find healing and reconciliation in Jesus Christ. The problem is we get so sideways into thinking that it's our job as Christians to correct the moral failures of culture and to right all the wrongs of society. You know we're not that powerful, right? You realize that the wrongs that are happening in our society are happening at the hands of people who don't know Jesus. We've got to quit expecting people who don't know Christ to act like Jesus. 
you realize we're not the Savior. You're not the Savior of the world. I'm not the Savior of the world. Jesus is, and so we ought to let Jesus do what only Jesus can do. It's not our job to right all of the moral wrongs and all of the, uh, the inconsistencies of our culture. The most well-known verse of Scripture is found in John chapter 3. And in John chapter 3, Jesus says uh, that God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We know that verse. We can quote that verse, but do we know what comes next? No, what comes next is God didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but rather that through Jesus, people could be saved. Which tells me and tells you that if God didn't send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, he probably didn't send you or I either. This phrase, to pour salt on a wound, originally meant that it would bring healing. This is what Jesus was talking about when he was saying that we're the salt of the earth, but more often than not, we tend to adopt the more modern understanding of pouring salt on the wound and bringing pain to an already broken world. I can't tell you how many people every single week I talk to who are just hurting. They're broken, wounded, abused, abandoned, I've been a pastor for 19 years. Next May, I'll be a pastor full-time for 20 years. And I have never in my life as a pastor heard someone say, you know what, that Christian was such a jerk. They were so belittling. They were, they were so arrogant and so rude that I decided I wanted to be a follower of Jesus too. I've never heard that, not once. So, We have to, inside the church, outside the church, on the freeway, in the grocery store, at the baseball field, at our kids' school, in your school, at Baylor University, at USC, at whatever school that you're at, we ought to be that place and those people that anyone and everyone can come to no matter where they're at. Where they, and meet them where they're at, where they feel like they belong. Listen, I've studied evangelism strategies. I've written papers on it. Uh, I've got two degrees about it. Uh, I've spoken at conferences about evangelism, but I'm starting to wonder if the best evangelism strategy that we can employ is to love Jesus and be loved by him, to care for people, to actually love people, to share the good news of the gospel, and then don't be a jerk. Can I go further? It is not biblical to treat people the way that they treat you. It's not biblical. You want to know what is biblical? Treat people like Jesus treats people. It's biblical to treat people based on how much God loves them, not how much they're reciprocating their love to you. Listen, evangelism isn't just about telling someone that they're wrong. It's about telling someone that Jesus makes them right no matter how wrong they've been. And so my question for you is today, what flavor, salt brings flavor, what flavor does your life give? Do your words tell? Maybe, maybe today you need to tell somebody the good news Maybe you need to become that healing, reconciling voice that they're desperately needing. Maybe for some of you, you need to apply that gospel balm to your own life. Maybe that person is you. Listen, look up here. God did not put you on this earth so that you could listen to the enemy in your mind tell you you that you're not good enough. You want to know how you can tell the difference between conviction from the Holy Spirit and condemnation from our enemy? Conviction leads to a greater longing to love more like Jesus. Condemnation, on the other hand, distracts us so that we focus on how unlovable we are. We all need a fresh start. People in our community need a fresh start. 
They need a place where they can heal, where they can hear that God can restore their life can put back together what's broken, those broken relationships, those broken dreams, those uh, broken directions, the loss, the bad church experience. People need that fresh start. You ever eaten an entire bag of chips? I guess I'm the only one. Let me tell you what happens when you eat an entire bag of chips. You get really, really thirsty And so we've got to ask ourselves in light of what we know about the properties of salt, that it flavors and that it makes us thirsty, is our life making anyone thirsty for the kingdom of God? When someone sees how you live, does it make them ask the question, is there more to my life than I'm currently experiencing? Or is your life just too bland for anyone to feel thirsty? For salt in our community, for salt in our workplaces, in our grocery, at the malls, at the coffee shops, it should make people feel thirsty for Jesus. Mountain View, let's be those people. Let's be that place that people thirst for Jesus. Let me just tell you this as a caveat because I know some of you are thinking, well, that's probably gonna mean that we've gotta we've got to change our views on certain things or we've got to water down. No, we're not, I'm not talking about diluting anything because Jesus goes on to say in this message, he says in, in verse 13, you're the salt of the earth, but if that salt loses its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. How does salt lose its saltiness? We got to go back to eighth grade science class. To sodium chloride. Salt loses its saltiness when it's contaminated by other materials. When it's diluted, it's no longer salt. Salt, if you remember from eighth grade, which I know is a long time for many of you. If you remember back to eighth grade, it's a very stable compound. The chemical bond of salt in ACL is very tight. Even in water, salt molecules stay together. But if salt is diluted and over-diluted, it eventually loses its effectiveness. Translation, we're going to stick to the Bible around here. We're, we're people of the word. We're, we're not going to water down this message so that it's more palatable. We, we said it a couple of weeks ago. We're not going to sanitize the words in the life of Jesus. We're not going to dilute it. We're not going to dumb it down. G.K. Chesterton Chesterton said this, those who marry the spirit of the age will find themselves widows in the next. We've got to keep the gospel salty. We've got to preach the gospel, live the gospel. And yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to confront us, but it will also comfort us so that it can preserve us and cleanse us. What's going to dilute our salt? What's going to dilute our ability to bring healing and to preserve in our culture. Walter Brueggemann says it this way, the crisis with the U.S. church has almost nothing to do with being liberal or conservative. It has to do with giving up the faith and the discipline of our baptism and settling for a common generic U.S. identity that's part patriotism, part consumerism, part violence, and part affluence. Jesus says, we got to stay salty. And then he goes on in verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. Right across From the hillside, you've got Magdala on one side of Jesus and his teaching. Across the Sea of Galilee is this mega city of Hippos. It's a city that's 1,100 feet above sea level of the Sea of Galilee. It was a flat-topped hill that was just across the water and part of the Decapolis, part of this 10 Greek city community. It was one of the highest cities around, one of the wealthiest, most prominent, most prestigious cities in the first century. 
And so when Jesus says to these people who are listening to his teaching, and he says to us today, you are the light of the world, positioned on a city on a hill. He's not just talking hypothetical here. He's making an actual geographic reference to this town of Hippos. If you think about the illuminating technology of Jesus' day, how much light does one lamp create? Not a whole lot. But when you've got hundreds of lamps that are gathered and clustered together, then it lights up the sky. Flashlights, bulbs in our day are measured in lumens. Literally one lumen is how much light one lamp would put off. So if you think about it, thousands of little lights coming together could produce significant light. Imagine with me a first century ancient world. There's no street lights, no halogen bulbs, no LED lights, no flashlights, no reflectors, no street signs. And so if you could imagine traveling from one city to the next, it's pitch black. There could be all kinds of violent attacks, leaving everyone incredibly and deeply vulnerable when they travel. But in that day, if you looked up to this city of Hippos, a city on a hill, with thousands of lights glowing, historians said that you could see the city of Hippos from all across the Sea of Galilee. Jesus says, in the same way, let your light shine so that others may see your good deeds and think that you're awesome. No, no. So that they could see your good deeds and then want to be just like you. No, so that they could see your good deeds and glorify Jesus. This word good deeds is the Greek phrase kalos, which means beautiful, good, attractively good, a good that inspires and motivates. Jesus says, let your light shine so that they will glorify your Father in heaven. When the church is being the church in the Jesus way, It's not about the church at all. It's all about Jesus. It's not about our works. It's about his work in and through us. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about Mountain View. It becomes God on display as we serve, as we lead, and as we love. Jesus positions two things that are totally opposite. He says, you're the salt of the earth and the light of the world. They're, in some ways, very opposite. Salt is only effective when it's spread out. If for some reason you've ever grabbed a a jar of salt when you're trying to season your chips at the Mexican restaurant, y'all know what I'm talking about? And and the, the salt lid is a little bit loose and the whole thing goes out. If you dump all of the salt in one place, it's what we say, muy mal. It's very bad. So salt, it's only effective when it's spread out and sprinkled and scattered when it's applied. Light, on the other hand, the kind that Jesus is talking about, a city on a hill, is only effective when all the lights come together. So what is it exactly that Jesus is inviting us to? Should we live scattered throughout the world in every part of society, or should we live gathered and huddled together? The answer is yes. Jesus is saying that life in the kingdom is both scattered and gathered. Scattered like salt, gathered like light. Scattered living our lives, gathered doing life together. Jesus reminds us that salt preserves and cleanses. It brings flavor. It brings thirst. Light, on the other hand, allows people to see, to avoid danger, to find their way and appreciate the beauty of his creation. Every single Sunday, we gather like this. But then every single Sunday, we scatter into the neighborhoods across our community. And if Sunday morning is all you do at Mountain View, you are doing it wrong. If today is your only participation in the life of the church, you're just missing out on what's so much better for you. 
gathering, it's not that it's incorrect, it's just that it's incomplete. There's no way that in a large group like this we can shepherd and care and do life with one another and share life together like Jesus designed us to. And so if you're not in a small group, I would encourage you today, before you go, I know it's Father's Day, you got a lot to do, there's golf on, there's a lot happening Uh, You're going to go to brunch and you're going to overpay for orange juice and it's going to frustrate dad and he's going to be like, wow, we should have eaten at home. But go and get connected in a small group. Do life in community because Jesus says we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. So may we be a church that's gathered and never lose that. But know that we can do more together than we can alone. And when we scatter... May we be the salt and light together, changing the world around us. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we're grateful for such a clear picture of your invitation for us today. God, may we be people who help to preserve what's good, stand up against what's wrong, give us the courage and the boldness to bring healing and help and health. God, may we bring a flavor of goodness to the world around us and be the light that shines for Jesus. Not so that someone can see our politics, not so that someone can see our power or our position, but so that someone can see our Father who is so good to us today. We know his goodness because of Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.